Peter, having been trained in the biological sciences, I've obviously studied evolution, but never the philosophy of evolutionary biology. You're one of the pioneers in the field. Um, let's start with what are the conditions, the philosophical underpinnings, in, in essence, of evolution? Well, if we start from Darwin back in 1859, uh, The Origin of Species, there's roughly speaking two main things that he did in that book. He argued for the tree of life given a literal genealogical interpretation with common ancestry linking all the different organisms on Earth. And he described a very simple looking mechanism by which change would occur in particular populations that, that make up that big tree, evolution the mechanism of evolution by natural selection. And one of the things that's always been interesting both biologically and now philosophically is the combination of the simplicity and the power of this mechanism. It shouldn't, it seems that something so simple shouldn't be able to do so much. So trying to make sense of that has been an ongoing project. Now in summarizing the mechanism or the machine, actually I always feel a bit wary using the word machine in this context, but it, it just, it rolls off the tongue to some extent in this setting. In summarizing the mechanism, I like best, as a starting point at least, a formulation given by Richard Lewinton, a geneticist, uh, back around 1970. So distilling everything down to basics, Lewinton said, if there's a population of anything at all, any kind of objects, in which there's variation between the different members of the population, and there's reproduction, there's some there's some capacity for old ones to give rise to new ones, either in a, in a very neat copying-like way or in a messier sort of way. And in that reproductive process, there are two additional features. One is that there's heredity, that parents or the old ones that give rise to the new ones tend to resemble the new ones. You have parent-offspring resemblance to some extent. There's a kind of correlation across generations. And thirdly, there are differences in how much the members of the population reproduce. Some reproduce a lot, some reproduce a little, some not at all. Lewinton said that's sort of the machine, that's, that's or the recipe, as I call it, for mm. Darwinian evolution. There's a population in which there's variation, there's heredity as part of reproduction, and differences in reproductive success. Mm. And as Lewinton said, if you've got that, then the machine will run, then mm. the, the process will operate. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now, as the uh, philosophy of evolution uh, ha has developed, um, there have been many different approaches to it. In fact, where in the process, the so-called levels or units of, of selection, um, and you've uh, posited, as opposed to a lot of the very specific arguments, the concept of a Darwinian population. Uh, what does that mean? I'd like to dig into that. Well, initially, it's um, a, a sort of redescription and a refinement of that picture that uh, Lewinton gave back in 1970. So suppose we say that any collection of objects that has the features that Lewinton described, variation, heredity, differences in amount of reproduction. Suppose we use the term Darwinian population for any collection of things that has those features. Then we've, we've sort of picked out the ingredients and the preconditions for the machine to operate. Now, one thing that I did in the book that introduced this, this way of describing things is think a lot about the processes by which a collection of objects comes to have those sort of Darwinizing or Darwinized features and the processes by which a collection of objects might lose them. So there's all sorts of marginal cases as well as clear cases. The human population, we are a very clear case of a Darwinian population. There are members of the population, we differ one from another in various ways, we reproduce, and when we reproduce, quirks tend to get passed on, not always, but sometimes from parent to offspring. And that's, you know, that's the machine. But also the cells within our bodies, an individual body, so the cells within your body, they are a kind of Darwinian population mm. too, because <laughs> through cell division, they reproduce and they pass on characteristics, but they don't behave in the same way evolutionarily as the whole organisms, the human beings do. So one of the things I tried to do 
in a lot of detail in that book is understand the different kinds of Darwinian oh. population yeah. there are mm. and what makes some cases like the population of humans a kind of what you might call a sort of high powered Darwinian population and what makes some other cases like the population of cells within you a kind of you know low powered or not very Darwinian collection of things. But then there would be some kind of a nesting uh, there'd be different levels, and yes. so the, as you have these different levels of Darwinian populations, because if it's a principle that's working on all life, then as you get higher and higher, it gets more and more complex. It gets more and more complex, and this takes us into these often very fractious debates about higher levels of selection. Right. So we've talked just now about the population of organisms, human beings, there's a population of cells, which are a lower level population because cells make up humans. Within cells, there are chromosomes and individual genes, and they have their own ability to behave mm -hmm. in this Darwinian mm -hmm. way too. Mm -hmm. Now, above the level of ordinary organisms, you have human groups and societies, family groups, uh, you know, clans and tribes back in prehistory and to some, ex to some extent still continuing. The question of whether groups can themselves be parts of a Darwinian population at that level has been one of the most controversial questions. Mm. And right, as you say, it's very complex. We have a hierarchy going all the way up from large groups of organisms as potential Darwinian individuals up there, all the way down to chromosomes and genes at the You're Using this term, level. Darwinian individuals, that's a subset of the Darwinian populations? That's just one of the, th if, if, if human beings are a Darwinian population, then each human it, it, is a Darwinian individual. And so how does that help us in our analysis? Well, the, you just, you, you, need, you need terms for both kinds of objects. There's, you, there's a term for the collection that has okay. its processes going on and there's a term for the members of the population that each participate in these processes mm. in their own way. Mm. So a Darwinian individual like you can also, when you zoom in closely, be revealed as a Darwinian population of cells as well at a lower level. Mm. Mm. Um, you've also talked about um, uh, the, that a, a subject, uh, and maybe that's a population or cells, can be both cause and effect. That, that, that seems like a, a, an unusual idea. This also is uh, a theme that I got to thinking about as a consequence of Richard Lewinton's work, Richard Lewinton, the Harvard geneticist who I, I mentioned a while ago. Worth describing, I think, perhaps his enormous influence. You know, he's a biologist, he was a geneticist, did a lot of important work on fruit fly genetics and human genetics in his lab at Harvard. But along the way, he became a kind of, well, a central figure in, in the development of philosophy of biology because a lot of people, including me, came to spend a year in his lab. He had a kind of natural ability to philosophize in a way that was tightly integrated with his scientific work. And my favorite of his more philosophical papers is a paper called The Organism as the Subject and Object of Evolution. What he wanted to argue is that in conventional evolutionary thinking, organisms are things to which things are done right, to. Right, you know, they're, right, they're the kind of right. recipients of evolutionary forces rather than the initiators of evolutionary act processes and activities. And Lewinton, who had, a, who had Marxist sympathies and was attracted to a dialectical picture of nature, wanted to argue that organisms were both. They were the sort of recipients and originators of evolutionary forces in a way that had been neglected by mainstream biology. Mm. Now, I think he went a little too far in those arguments, but the insight that we have to think about organisms as not just recipients of evolutionary, not just the beneficiaries or recipients of evolutionary goings on, but the originators and the sort of subjects from which evolutionary events come, I think that was an important insight. And one of the themes of my current work is trying to uh, think about the ways that different sorts of organisms have this subject-like role in the evolutionary process.